Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the first of the Sussex IET meetings for the 2021-2022 uh, season. Um, today, we are fortunate to have uh, Dr. Christopher Holmes um, to talk to us about how to use light to make aircraft lighter. Um, let me just introduce uh, Dr. Christopher Holmes. He's a Royal Society Industrial Fellow with GE Aviation and a Senior Enterprise Fellow in the Optoelectronics Research Centre at the University of Southampton. His research involves development of new types of optical fibre for condition monitoring, high value laminated, laminated composites, for example, carbon fibre reinforced polymer, wear of gears and bearings, and interrogation of fuels and lubricants. Um, and um, let me just pass you over to, to Chris. Astronauts have always uh, commented about the fragility of Earth looked down from space. They always see a blue orb in the blackness sea. Um, I guess some of the research direction that I feel most passionate about is trying to create sustainability uh, on this planet. And largely the way I think we can do that is to, to measure and to know more. Um, and so a lot of the optical research that I've been involved with at the University of Southampton is to think of new innovative ways of how we can measure. And primarily my direction has been uh, looking towards the aviation um, sector. And what I'm largely looking to do is to create sustainability within the aviation um, sector. So this th means things like use less materials and use less materials means extending the life of aircraft um, and also reducing some of the design conservatism that is placed within those aerostructures. Um, also to make things more intelligent, so by monitoring and combining it with artificial intelligence, we can think of systems that can have seamless maintenance and integrate seamless maintenance within the um, aerospace sector, so that causes less disruption, uh, less disruption to the flow of energy, um, the more, uh, the less sort of CO2 and polluting uh, aerospace will be. And also just to en enhance efficiency, so looking at fuel quality and the efficiency of, of moving parts of bearings and engines and so forth, um, and, and, and using that information to enhance the efficiency of propulsion. So what I've been sort of exploring over the last 10 or so years is how we can make aircraft lighter through the use of optical monitoring. So the title of this talk is How to Use Light to Make Aircraft Lighter. My name is Christopher Holmes and I'm from the Optoelectronics Research Center uh, at the University of Southampton. Uh, this work is conducted in the Aero Laser Lab is facing towards the to blending photonics uh, to the aerospace sector. So if we have a little look at uh, modern aircraft today, so take this picture, for example, of the Boeing 787 Dreamliner. Uh, we look back, say, 50 years. I mean, it doesn't really look on the surface that much has changed noting that if we go back a further 50 years from the uh, Boeing 747, we'd be talking about bike lanes. Um, the design looks largely the same. It's a tube and a pair of wings um, with some jet engines strapped to them. But the cleverness really has been, and the advances really have been in the types of materials that aircraft are now made of. So not many people know this, there's been almost a silent change silent growth into composite materials. So now the latest commercial aircraft are composed of something like 80% of composite materials. So by composite materials, I mean things like carbon fiber reinforced polymer, glass fiber reinforced polymer and other composites. So these are laminated structures. They're great because they, um, they enhance the design freedom. There are things you can make from composite materials which you simply can't make with traditional alloys. Uh, and they also have improved the stiffness to weight ratio. However, one of the disadvantages of composites, and really I guess where 
I entered, uh, my head entered this uh, this research space was removes the Faraday cage protection. So where, whereas a nice alloy is an inherent Faraday cage, um, you do have to worry about worry about the vulnerability, certainly of electronic systems conducting electro electrical cables, as soon as you move to composite materials. So for example, things that um, aerospace engineers are concerned about is direct lightning strikes that happen all too frequently. You can imagine if there's a direct uh, cable that would go from the area that's been hit um, to a fuel tank, a trace of um, that lightning could cause a catastrophic explosion within the tank. Uh, let alone to say about frying the, the sensors and avionics that, um, that the bolt would hit. Obviously, if you move towards optical fibers, optical fibers are, are non-conducting. So optics seems a natural um, solution for this issue. So optical fibers, they're actually used already in aviation, um, but not, not really used um, as much as they have potential to be used. So largely you get plastic optical fibers used for the entertainment systems, the head up displays, um, but you get the in-flight entertainment. Compared to say copper cable, if you're looking at a, um, A380, Airbus A380, those, those planes have about 330 miles of, of copper cabling. Um, whereas the entertainment systems are, are only maybe a couple of miles or so. Um, so fractionally, they're, they're very, very small, but when you look at the numbers and the figures and the advantages that optical fibers possess, um, you do wonder why they've not been used more ubiquitously. So for example, as I've mentioned, they have an inherent immunity, um, the non-conducting and they have an inherent immunity to electromagnetic interference, EMI. Um, they can also, as well as um, carrying a large bandwidth, so if you think of CAT6 cabling um, carrying gigabit per second, I mean, the, the ultimate top limit of single mode optical fiber is entering uh, petabit, petabit per second. So, you know, several orders of magnitude uh, greater bandwidth. But as well as this, the, the, the extremely light, um, so an, an optical fiber is about the dimension of a human hair. Um, and it's made of glass. Now, a lot of the um, commercial um, optical fiber cabling that you get is um, the weight is in the jacketing, etc. But even so, it's about an order of magnitude per unit length lighter. So imagine if you, for example, on the, okay, the, the A380 is an absolute mammoth. I mean, typically in commercial aircraft, there's about 70 miles of copper cabling. Um, but if you could replace that 70 miles of copper, copper cabling for an ultra light, very high bandwidth optical fiber, um, you know, there's going to be huge weight savings there. And in aircraft, huge weight savings correspond to greater flight efficiency um, and less CO2 um, pollution in the atmosphere. Also with optical communications, you need fewer repeaters. Um, again, they can go an order of magnitude greater in length before a re repeater is needed. So you have greater signal integrity. Um, and they're also good, and this is what I'm largely interested in, um, they're very good for distribution sensing. So you can actually put many hundreds of sensing points along a single strand of optical fiber. Now, if you think about the, the same for electronic systems, um, you'd normally need individual cables for ind each individual um, sensor element. Now, this adds complexity to, to the fitting process and also unnecessary weight. Um, but with a single optical fiber, you can, you, you can sense uh, at many different points, and you can also sense many different things if you harness the fiber in the correct way. And, and that's one of the things that I've been looking at. And also another um, tick advantage that uh, optical fibers have is that um, they have really good immunity to very harsh environments. Um, so for example, um, operating at high temperatures, um, you can easily operate an optical fiber at a few hundred degrees Celsius, no problem. Um, normally the issue comes in the, the outer jacketing and uh, not the glass itself. Um, and even there are applications and there are commercial um, sensors that are now being put on jet engines that use sapphire fibers 
I mean, they could be used in excess of a thousand degrees Celsius. So they're, they're really, um, in terms of the harsh environment's ruggedness, uh, they have a great advantage also. So I just wanted to show, I'm unfortunately not there in person, but there's an experiment I would show you to demonstrate um, total internal reflection, which is how optical fibers guide light. So this is the Tyndall experiments taken from YouTube, unfortunately, and not in person. Um, but here we have effectively a column of water with a hole in. Um, and on the right hand side, we have a, a lovely green laser pointer. And that's projecting through the column um, and um, gets ejected through the column of water and you get total internal reflection um, and you see how that managed to capture the light and pulls the, the light down, um, changing its direction. Now in the case of the, the Tyndall experiments, we had a column of water and what caused the total internal reflection was the refractive index difference between the water and the air. Um, in optical fiber, it's slightly different. So the way optical fibers are made, I mean, typically if you remove all the, the buffer and the jacket material, they're about 125 microns um, in diameter. But the actual light itself is, is guided within the core region of that. Um, so for what's known as single mode fiber, uh, this diameter, this inner core diameter, which is a dark blue circle on the right hand side there is of the order seven, seven to eight microns. I mean, these fibers can be smaller again, so typically commercially available, they go down to, to 70, around about 70 microns. So extremely, extremely small. And for a lot of the applications I'm looking at, so one project I've got at the moment is looking at monitoring of uh, the gearbox of helicopters, epicyclic uh, gearbox of, of a helicopter. Um, and you can imagine with such a hair-like strand, you can act, uh, act, and the ability to put many, many sensors along the single strand, you can get quite a lot of um, high fidelity data uh, from that gearbox. Um, so some of the work I'm doing there is basically taking that data and plugging it into AI models for uh, un understanding the um, condition of such a system. But this is a, this, this is a great advantage that optical fibers provide. Another area that I work on is uh, planar optics. So the idea here is um, rather than a single strand, you can think of it like a single lane of, uh, on a road, light goes in one end and it's kicked out the, end, the other end. Uh, these are chips, so the, the circuits, they're optical circuits, if you like. And um, on the left-hand side there is a top-down view um, of a circuit that splits light. So you've got uh, red light from a Heaney laser uh, being injected into the circuit, and you see it splitting off on, into many tracks. And on the, the right hand side is the on the right hand side there's a side projection of what uh, this chip is made of. So it's largely uh, uses a silicon substrate. So actually these planar optics can be in many materials, uh, but the material that I typically use is silica based because that's what optical fibers are made of. Um, so the silica actually rests upon a silicon substrate because they're relatively cheap, um, and it's it's made again of a um, what, what we call a cladding, which is a thick glass layer. We then have this core, a bit like an optical fiber, that core is a slab, and then we have a, an overclad layer. And through with processes called lithography, which goes on in a clean room, uh, we can actually define these um, effectively structures that are similar in dimension to a single mode optical fiber. So the, the, the structures you see there are actually seven microns by seven micron in the cross section. So just a little bit about uh, planar optics or planar integrated optics. Uh, the idea behind them is basically a bit like you know, valves uh, mini were miniaturized by integrated electronics. The idea is that you can miniaturize bulk optics, lenses, beam splitters, mirrors upon a chip. So that's the, that's the whole concept behind them. And they're routinely used for telecom sensing, quantum applications. Um, both, both in research and commercially. So another te technique for making, oh, another technique for making uh, planar integrated optics is through, that we use is through a process called direct UV laser writing. Um, so what this does is uses a 
focus UV laser beam. If I can get the video started, I will. There we go. Um, so this shows a top-down view of what you're seeing on the left-hand side there. So effectively what happens is a UV laser beam, which lasers at a wavelength of 244 nanometers, is focused to a very small spot into the central core of a three-layer glass system that I described before. And through traversing the sample with respect to the spot, you can create this, for example, this beam, this um, one by eight splitter. And you see that one by eight is again uh, fabricated there. So there's a lot of uh, fluorescence going on, but the actual spot size is of that order seven to eight microns in diameter. And you can actually see the other waveguides that have been written. Um, so this is a sort of step by step process done in real time. Another technique that we use is uh, using dual beams. So rather than a single beam to write, draw out uh, a waveguide, something about the, the intensity of, of light here. So it's about a million times more intense than the radiation that you get um, from the sun uh, during, during the daytime here on Earth, but a very intense um, laser spot. Um, but we have a system where we use two beams or two coherent laser beams. And because they're coherent, uh, when we focus them to a spot and overlap them, they actually create an interference pattern. And what, what do we want this interference pattern for? Well, if we modulate correctly this, this pattern, we can actually create both waveguides um, and uh, what are called Bragg gratings. So Bragg gratings can be placed in optical fibers and also in these planar optics that I um, showed you earlier. And what they effectively are is um, periodic structures. You may be familiar with the term Bragg with um, things like X-ray crystallography. Uh, but the idea is, is very simple that um, because of this periodic structure, basically what you can get is um, constructive interference returning. Um, and because of the relative period of that Bragg rating, you get a particular wavelength of light uh, being reflected and being emitted um, within the transmission. So the plots down below are basically the, the power versus the wavelength. And the concept being that if we can monitor these, these peaks coming back, we can make some inference on the thing that causes it. So the equation at the bottom there, the, uh, the small lambda, is the refle reflected wavelength. So that's running across the x-axis. Um, and that's a function basically of the refractive index of the glass material in the, in the fiber, um, and also the, the periodicity of what we defined with that dual beam system. Now, obviously you can imagine if you stretch this optical fiber, you'll create a change in density, which will create, which will change the refractive index. And you will also change the period, uh, which is the larger lambda, um, in that equation at the bottom, which will again change the wavelength. So you can actually infer the level um, of tensile or compressive strain in the fiber by looking at the optical back reflected signal. So that's one way that you can um, use optical fibers for monitoring. And one cool thing about optical fibers is you can put many of these structures, and indeed we do, many of these periodic structures along a single fiber. And this uh, spectra here, wavelength uh, versus reflected power, shows you a whole series, I believe it's 15 Bragg racings in this instance. Obviously not particularly densely packed at all, um, but each of these could, for example, be an individual sensor. So you've got 15 sensors, for example, make me strain sensors, temperature sensors, upon the single uh, piece of fiber. One thing I didn't quite mention is um, the whole process with our laser writing system is computer controlled. Um, so what we can do is actually create in spectral space a huge range of very intricate um, bright racing designs. Um, and these can be leveraged for the sensing application that we have in mind. So one thing I've been doing with these planar optics in the um, 
aerospace sector is thinking about alternative for MEMS components. So uh, MEMS are uh, mechanical, electromechanical, uh, microelectromechanical systems. Um, and these are the sort of things that you get in your smartphones and the use for everything from pressure sensing to inertial sensing, um, vibration sensing. Um, there's a huge number of applications for MEMS and a lot of them are even, you know, uh, use it, or early ones are used in the automotive industry. Um, but as I, I linking back to this um, issue with composite materials, ideally what the aerospace sector are after is to think of alternative sensors that don't use um, electronic or electrical powering them, um, so all optical um, in, the, in the response. So these developed sensors, so these are based on a silica on silicon technology. These were made um, in a clean room, a little bit like MEMS sensors are, but they operate just using light, so there's no electronic elements to them at all. And in these three examples, so example A shows membranes, um, example B is a bridge, um, and C is a cantilever. And the idea basically is we can run with our laser writing system, we can create a waveguide and we can create one of these Bragg gratings, for example, on one of these structures. And then as one of the, as, and then as the structure moves, the Bragg gratings moves as an influence on the Bragg grating, And then we can interrogate that spectrally. We can look at the light signal coming back and interpret what's actually gone on and make some inference on the physical states of the environment. That's it. So an example of what we did with a company called Parker Aerospace, which is a supplier for you know, companies like Boeing and Airbus, um, is to create a pressure sensor. So this is one of those membrane type components that were on that earlier slide. And here's a picture of it on, on the right. It's based on a silicon chip and it looks like the, it looks like a bit of a donut. It looks like a, a blank space in the middle, but it's actually an ultra thin um, glass sheet. And that glass sheet is 50 microns in thickness. And the concept here, as I've mentioned before, is you have this waveguide and you have this Bragg gracing um, that's, that's over the membrane. And when the pressure P1 and um, P1 and P1, at the, P, pressure at the top of the bottom at P1 and they're both equal, um, there's no deflection, but um, you put light into that and you look at the light signal back and you get this Bragg gracing response. And then you change the pressure, the membrane deflects that ultimately changes what the membrane, uh, what the Bragg racing looks like, and you get this spectral shift. So here the, you see there's a notable change in the period of the Bragg racing, and that causes a red shift spectrally. Um, so, so there we can look at differential pressures. That's an example of a, of a sensor that we've been developing. And as I mentioned before, we're really fortunate um, in the University of Southampton. So we use tools like this in the clean room. So we have uh, various areas in a huge clean room complex that allows for fabrication and metrology um, of these intricate um, chips. Um, and so a lot of the developments work I went on on that chip, went on in, in this clean room um, and, and, and was developed before being pushed out to the industry sponsor. So here we have, um, one of the PhD students that work beyond be, um, behind these membranes, and this is Alex Janssen. Um, and Alex is actually smiling behind this image here because there was a number of failures up to this point um, that he'd come across with this being very sort of um, groundbreaking work on these sensors. And you can actually see it on this particular wafer here, this broken sensor, one of the failure elements that he'd come across um, so there's, there's two membranes here that pop completely out. Um, this was one of the frequent free features that Alex found, that if he, he got the conditions wrong, these membranes would, would simply go pop and land on the floor and you'd be left with a nice piece of flexible glass, uh, just not in the position that it was intended to be in. Now this was, a, this was an issue, but later on in the story, you'll see that it's actually not an issue, it's a benefit. Um, but initially this was an issue. I'm glad to say that Alex came up with recipes that overcome this. So largely the issue here is um, the glass is put down at 
um, a thousand degrees Celsius or even over a thousand degrees Celsius. And there's an, a thermal, there's an order of magnitude um, thermal expansion mismatch between silica and silicon. So that's what causes a huge amount of stress and that's ultimately what caused this failure. Uh, but as I say, every failure has a silver lining and uh, there was a success story behind this I'll mention in a moment. But this, these were the optical sensors that we did. did. So, you know, basically what we, what we had was uh, wafer scale um, membranes. We then broke them down or cut them down into individual chips. We could put optical fibers, align optical fibers to the waveguides and the chips to get the signals in and out. Um, and then we uh, came up with some packaging with our um, partner, in this case, Parker. So, I mean, this, the story, um, the, the, the story on those broken membranes um, sort of stopped there as we'd found a solution. But I went to a, um, an engagement, an um, interdisciplinary engagement event at the University of Southampton, and I got talking to people that are outside the optics realm. Um, I got speaking to uh, mechanical engineers, of all people. Um, and basically something that I'm interested in, because, oh, you know, the optical sensors are looking for solutions for, you know, some of the issues behind carbon fiber um, airframes is um, carbon fiber and the research that goes on in it, which is a huge amount in, uh, in the University of Southampton. So this is uh, one of the, this, this just shows another capability that we've got in Southampton. This is X-ray computer tomography, but I think it's really nice. It shows you what we're talking about, uh, carbon fiber uh, reinforced polymer. So it's uh, basically laminated sheets. Uh, so this is captured with an X-ray uh, CT scan, um, and the actual carbon fibers are sort of micron, of micron order. Um, see on the right hand side there. So from my uh, colleagues in mechanical engineering, I realized there was a great challenge, as they put it, in, uh, in composite material. The, well, it's, I guess it's almost kind of obvious when you think about the physics. It's um, the composite materials, it is, it is a sandwich, it's like a sandwich, like a, like a sandwich in the picture there, that it's, it's greater carrying loads that are in plane, so in the direction of the bread, um, but it's absolutely horrific at, at carrying any load at all in a through thickness direction. Um, and the main challenge is actually looking at strains in that through thickness direction. So if there's anything like delamination where those layers um, start to pull away from each other, then that can lead to absolute catastrophic failure, as, as, it, as you can easily imagine, just because it's such a weak um, dimension for, for, these comp for these layered composites. Now, fortunately, there's no scalable technology that exists to monitor through thickness strains. So in this diagram here, epsilon one and epsilon three were, were covered by that with, you know, commercial um, sensing capability and even a lot of developmental sensing capability. Um, but this through thickness sensor ability is really, is really, you know, th there is no scalable solution um, that has been shown yet for this through thickness strain. So that was kind of a challenge that the mechanical engineers put to me and we're wondering whether there's any optical solution uh, that could be drawn out and, and we could think about um, in order to measure that. So just to give you a, an idea of sort of commercially what's easily available, you can have things like four base strain gauges. So these are just looking effectively at the resistance in one dimension. Um, so it, it, it is basically just a, just a track. You, you extend that track and, and you cause a resistance change. And as before, I've mentioned optical fibers. I mean, this is technology that's been 30 plus years. People have been putting these ultra small hair-like optical fibers within composite materials between ply layers. They're great for looking at um, in-plane strains, but again, you're limited to, um, you can't pull out through thickness strain, which is the big thing, the big issue um, that my colleagues in, in mechanical engineering were explaining. So coming back to this, to measure is to know, um, it seemed completely feasible to me that certainly with planar optics, this could be done. Um, so just a recap um, of electromagnetic fields in light, uh, you know, the light is an electromagnetic, um, has ele um, electrical and magnetic field components that are orthogonal to each other. 
Um, so the magnetic field components, B, the blue line on the right-hand side, so this is uh, looking front on, if you like, to the uh, wave depiction on the left-hand side. And then there's an electric field component, um, E, in red here. So if you look at the, what's known as the photoelastic effect, if you were to have this light, this, is, this could be propagating either into or out of the plane of the screen here. Um, if this was propagating in a, in a medium, um, obviously the light slows down or effectively slows down because it interacts with the atoms um, that are in the medium. And so it has a refractive index uh, which gives a, a ratio with respect to the, the speed of uh, the speed of light outside in a vacuum compared to in the medium. And with the photoelastic effect, if you apply a force um, to this bulk material, um, effectively what it, what it says or what it can give you is the you know, effective refractive index change um, that comes about because of that, that force. I call that N2. Now, if you spun the light around so it was orthogonal the, and had the same force, your refractive index would be different. Um, so this is known as a, a birefringence um, effect. Now, if I was there in person, I'd probably show you this next demonstration, um, which shows you the photoelastic effect. This is this can be um, shown on an overhead projector. Um, effectively, what it is, there's a, um, in this particular example, it's looking at stress concentrations at a notch. Um, so it's basically four point bending. So there's a point, two points at the top, two points at the bottom, and a load is applied. Uh, now, in this video, there's a, a polarized light, so there could be a polarizer uh, behind this, this perspex block that we're looking at with the notch. Um, and you see the, the person's putting another polarizer slightly off um, axis to the first. Um, and you see this, these beautiful um, colors emerging. Now, those colors emerge because that the photoelastic effect that I just mentioned in the previous slide is actually also um, a function of wavelength. So hence you see the splitting of the light using this rainbow effect. Um, but yeah, some of the, these stress patterns look, look really cool. Um, and they do also in, in, in person. You see as the load increases, these, these fringes get more, more and more. Uh, but anyway, that's, a, that's an interesting view. But ultimately what, what, my, um, what, what my thinking was, was basically we could use this photoelastic effect with one of our planar optic sensors. I and mean, we can basically put the planar optic sensor within the, within the ply layers of a composite. Now, with a planar, uh, a planar sensor, you know the polarization orientation. And you can actually launch both in at once. So you can have a, it's called a T and a TM mode. But basically, what that means is they're all orthogonal um, polarization states of light. And basically, looking at the refractive index change between those two, um, you can infer, or you can easily infer, what this through thickness. Um, strain component is. And remember, this through thickness strain was the was the issue all along. It was the um, it was a problem posed by uh, by colleagues in mechanical engineering. But they came up with a, an issue, as they always do, um, and they kind of described it as a bit like the, the princess and the pea. So this concept that only of your royalty can you tell whether there's a small pea underneath hundreds and hundreds of blankets. Um, the same seems to be true for composite materials, that any small deformation uh, within the composite can cause a huge knock-on effect in terms of its structural integrity. And um, so you are really limited to something very small. Um, and the sort of values they were speaking of is, well, we really need to get to what the order 60 microns or less to not have much of an effect or, or have negligible, negligible effect on the um, Structural integrity, and after all, you know, if this is going to be on a the wing, you know, if this is going to be looking at the structural integrity of an aircraft of wing. What you don't want is to put a sensor in there that's going to cause more problems than it solves. So, you know, you're looking for pro problems in through thickness strain and trying to look for delamination. But the thing you put in there is actually going to 
cause the wind to snap off, well, there's no point in even thinking about it. So we were really aiming for these 60 micron, very thin planar optics. And that's where I thought about poor old Alex and his, the woes he was having with his membrane sensors. Um, there's a light bulb moment that hit me that we could simply put an optical fiber on one of these membranes or we could refine the process a little bit more. And then we can slide that within the composite material. So this figure A here shows effectively the sort of membranes. It's, this is a very thin, and long, it's about one or two millimeters thick by about 60 millimeters long. Um, sorry, not thick, wide, it's about one or two millimeters wide. The thickness is 58 microns. Again, that's like this is what we needed. Um, and in this diagram, it's effectively sort of glued with a small amount of uh, epoxy um, onto an optical fiber. Um, and you see this in the uh, figure B basically shows the cross section, very thin cross section. Um, again, the three layer system um, with, where light can be confined using this laser written structure uh, within the core. And it's incredible how strong these things were. We kind of just threw them away when they broke originally on the on the pressure sensors. Um, but we were so this is three point bending that's done at the University of Southampton. Um, and we actually did fatigue tests. We did hundreds and hundreds of soft fatigue bending. Um, and here you we see an optical fiber um, on the left-hand side, three-point bending uh, at about one hertz uh, repetition. I'm um, just flexing this thing. And as I say, this was done over hundreds and hundreds of times with a little degradation to the optical signal or the mechanical integrity even of the, the structure. So the idea of what we've been playing around with is basically putting these flexible um, glass sheets um, within this laminated composite material. Um, so we've been looking at larger carbon fiber reinforced polymer as I've mentioned. And um, yeah, a, a year or two ago, we had the first success of um, embedding these structures. So here we have the, these, this is a cross section of an embedded uh, planar optic chip within carbon fiber reinforced polymer. And we see um, the zero degrees and 90 degrees basically refer to the orientation of the, um, of the carbon strands. So they can either be coming out at you or they could be um, going traversely. But yeah, you see 50 microns thick. Um, this is just a bit of maths. I mean, I like matrices, so I thought I'd just share this with you. But effectively what the experiment was doing was um, orthogonally within the, uh, the carbon fiber, we were looking at um, two orthogonal polarization states. So we basically looked at lights, two different types of lights in two different directions. And that's what's on the left-hand side there, this VT, this VTM. Um, and from that, we can pull out what's on the, the very far right-hand side, these epsilon components, which are the three strain components and delta T, which is temperature. Um, so we've got, got four things from these, uh, you know, launching light into this planar sheet in four different directions. Um, and in, in the matrix, the, the, blue, the blue part is basically the photoelastic effect. The red, red part is to do with the way the glass responds to temperature. Well, this is basically what the sensor uh, looked like. So we were basically using information from four different uh, brag gratings to pull out the information, um, the strain. And basically what this plot shows is the thing working. So uh, we compared the optical sensors with a process called uh, DIC, which is uh, differential image correlation. Basically what you do is you spray paint um, some carbon fiber, you take two images um, stereoscopically, um, and you basically look for those spots to move. Um, and we use the four base strain gauges as well that I mentioned before and see how they respond. So what this plot shows is the strain um, in, in an X component, Y component, and Z component, the Z component being through thickness. Um, and this is a snapshot for a one kilonewton um, load. Um, and as you see, um, the, the optical sensor, the one we developed this planar optical sensors in good agreement. Um, and obviously we had to use simulation because there's no sensor capability in this epsilon Z component, but with simulation, um, these the optical sensors seem to be able to pull out this um, through thickness strain. So, you know, this is tantalizingly close to becoming the world's first scalable real-time through thickness strain sensor for these composites. And why we care about this is um, I've, I've not 
I've not touched on, I briefly mentioned about composite materials and aircraft. Um, but unlike, for example, Formula One cars that are massively lightweight, what you get in aircraft is a huge amount of design conservatism. So what that means is, you know, basically people are using a bit more material, a bit more composite material to overcompensate um, for uncertainties within the material itself, uh, because it is actually very uncertain in terms of its failure modes. Now, what this means actually is, you know, you make one bit slightly bigger, so that causes another bit to be slightly bigger. And all of a sudden, if you actually look at the overall mass of an aircraft, despite the fact that um, there is there are um, advantages in terms of design freedom. So, for example, the winglets on the very tips of wings can, can create a five percent reduction in um, um, or a five percent improvement in fuel efficiency. There's actually no weight saving itself, really, um, or very minimal. Um, but by by understanding how the composite performs, we can really um, push this envelope or close this envelope uh, further and we can improve or we can lightweight aircraft significantly um, in order to make them more fuel efficient and less polluting. So this is the whole concept and motivation behind what we're doing here. We're given the ability to look at three-dimensional strains, so the strain within the through thickness dimension and also two in-plane components getting a lot of data from multiple um, sensing points. And then if you, for example, feed that into artificial intelligent models, um, you can you can have a better understanding of how the composite is doing. Um, and through that but anyway, this, this test um, is a little bit uh, complicated, but effectively what it shows on the y-axis is the maximum load uh, for various orientations of composite material. Uh, one thing to note here, the y-axis is actually split, so it looks a lot worse than it actually is. So it starts at 2,500 here. Um, um, and effectively what this shows in, in the gray <clears throat> is your sort of your control, your no um, sense of case. Um, and we see as we, um, as we put a sensor in, <clears throat> there's a small amount of uh, degradation to, um, to the strength. Um, but if we do things like taper the sensor or make the, the sensor slightly thinner, so in this case it was um, you're thinning it down to 30 microns, it, its influence on the composite structure um, appears to be negligible. So breaking or, or using the approach that Alex uh, used, which was uh, breaking of membranes, um, it's, it's a nice way of creating these these sensors but it's not particularly scalable and one thing that another um, area of expertise that we've got at the university of southampton is and we've done a huge amount of work on is uh, optical fiber drawing and um, so the way optical fibers are made and we make a whole range of very novel optical fiber structures is effectively you create something that's very large these can be you know, 100 millimeters even even larger for commercial um, what we call preforms. Um, and those huge glass rods are basically passed in a furnace. And then at the bottom of that, uh, that furnace, uh, they're, they're drawn into a very thin hair like strand. And that's how optical fibers are made. And these furnaces, because it's silica, uh, they're of the order of 2000 degrees C plus. So that's how optical fibers are made. And we have this huge capability at the University of Southampton. So I thought, well, why don't we? do or try to make these sheets of glass um, using, using a similar technique. So on the right-hand side there, we have a planar uh, preform. So it's a, it's a sheet of glass that's put into a furnace. So that that's what's on the bottom with all these green um, cooling hoses coming out. So it's a high temperature furnace. Um, and then it's drawn at the bottom. A bit like an optical fiber is drawn. And these are the glass sheets that we're getting out. So you know, there are 100 of microns in thickness, and we've managed to get down to 50 micron thickness. Um, and they're of the order of one millimeter or so in width. Um, so with these, we can easily uh, utilize them to pull out um, this true thickness strain of composite material. 
And on the left-hand side here, what we see is a, a initial trial of fusion um, splicing. So we can actually put optical fiber to these unusual planar uh, fiber substrates. We can fusion splice them. Um, so that means that you can network uh, many different optical sensors uh, within a composite structure. So this is largely, you know, we've shown this rather unique sensing um, capability that we that we hope will um, improve lightweight aircraft and improve fuel efficiency. Um, but there's so much more that you can do with these integrated optics or these planar integrated optics. And I think I mentioned a few um, applications before the what planar optics are used for, such as communication and routing and switching and modulation. Um, they can also be used for various uh, computation as well. Things that are sort of a lot of these uh, these latter points on the list that are uh, sort of emerging from the literature. So I'm really interested now to uh, to explore these and see what other optical functionality uh, we can draw out and what use they can have uh, within the real world. Um, so you know, the question is, what new functionality can we can we have? So the initial concept, a very easy concept, would be basically to make a switch out of one of these chips. So, for example, you can have multiple fibers coming in, multiple fibers going out. Um, this could be switched optically, but in this case, we we had a very small heating element and it was switched electrically. Um, so this is the, the construct. It's done in, um, in glass fiber. Here we have a, a planar chip. Um, and effectively, this shows the, the demonstration of that switch. Um, so effectively, what we're seeing here is, a, is the output of two optical fibers. Uh, so as the voltage increases, uh, effectively, the heating element um, increases in temperature on one of the on one, one side of the uh, this max ender interferometer, as it's called. Um, that, cr that creates a, a switching effect, so like it's from one side to another, up and back to the other side again. Now, why this might be of interest is, um, for example, if you have damage on a composite, this is one, one problem with composite materials, if you damage a composite and you have to repair it, you may need things that would bypass the damage section. So you can imagine if you had a single strand of optical fiber and you damage something upstream, everything downstream would be lost, so it'd be a bit of like numbness in the composite material. So all the sensors after that would not be addressable. Um, so this was experienced in the early days of telecommunication, um, or the subsea telecommunication, network, optical telecommunication um, networks. Um, and, and they use exactly, not, not these types of switches, but they use switches to overcome the problem and reroute um, signals. And that's exactly how I see this technology progressing. But there's a whole load of other applications that I'm afraid you're gonna have to watch this space um, that we have in the pipeline and under development at the moment. So in conclusion, I'm almost bang on the 50 minutes. Um, I hope I've shared with you some of the um, significant role that I believe photonics is going to have in the aerospace sector going forward. Just thinking, you know, logically about the advantages that optical fibers in the communications uh, realm can offer. And specifically what I'm interested in, which is optical monitoring and how we can best monitor these components um, on an aircraft. You know, we can use the distinct advantages the, the optical fibers and photonics provides um, to, to overcome some of the disadvantages that you, you can get with electronic technology. Um, and then I've introduced you something completely a bit wacky, which are these flexible planar optics that were, um, you know, the, the result of a, of actually something that went wrong, um, the, these blown pressure sensors, um, and actually utilize them for a world first demonstration of 3D sensing in, uh, in composite material. And we hope that this is going to be used to, to lightweight um, aircraft through knowing more about them in real time. Um, and also, there's going to be a whole host of new embedded optical functionality. I've shown the switch thus far, but we have uh, a lot more coming through on the pipeline that I hope to share with you, maybe next time in person. I don't really like this saying, so I just wanted to share it with you uh, from Alan Kay, he's a computer scientist. Um, you know, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And part of my job at the University of Southampton is 
trying to trying to do that, um, trying to create the future and think of new ways, new technologies that we can explore. I'd like to thank the Royal Society. Um, I'm a Royal Society Industry Fellow with GE Aviation. Um, the GE have been supportive of this composite work that we've been doing. Um, also with them, I'm looking into use of AI for um, epicyclic gear monitoring. I'd also like to thank the um, EPSERC, UKRI. Um, we were supported a grant that I've got at the moment on roll-to-roll -roll manufacture of multi-layer planar optics. And this is effectively the, the flexible drawn uh, sheets of glass um, that I showed in the, in the latter slides and trying to scale, scale some of the technology that we've got for application concerts. Also thanks to a huge number of people and, and other support. So uh, BA Systems will be picking up some of the sensor work that we've got through a, another studentship. Um, also thank GKN Aerospace for the support and guidance with composite materials and provision of composite materials. And Parker, that's where the original uh, work came from. Um, and also the people um, here who are, who are in the group um, and largely the, the people highlighted in gold who have gold or yellow, highlighted in gold, um, you've had a lot of uh, input into the development of this research. So that's all from me. Thanks very much for your time. Um, I hope I've interested you in the sort of research that we do at Southampton. Um, you can contact me, christopher.homes at sotton.ac.uk. If you have any further questions that you don't want to bring up in a, in a forum here, um, yeah, I'd like to open the floor to any questions. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for the what was a very interesting talk. Um, I have just put up in the chat um, the where you can get all your CPD certificate if that's what you would like. Um, let me start off, I'll ask a question, a non-technical question. Um, what percentage of the cabling um, on an aircraft is for the essential flight stuff and what percentage is for customer entertainment set systems? Oh, for, for optical fibers. So for optical fibers, it's all um, polymer optical fiber. Um, and that's, as I say, will vary on the aircraft. Um, but on the a, on the A three eighty, I think it's it's it is like a, a mile or two, um, compared to three hundred thirty um, miles of, of copper. Um, the actual function and what the and what they're used for, I think a lot of that three hundred thirty is is for comms. Um, the, the there is a bit of a, a fitting issue, or certainly there was an initial fitting issue with polymer fiber. So. Uh, or sort of glass fibre rather. So a lot of these entertainment systems <clears throat> were originally um, um, had glass optical fibre uh, connected to them. Um, but one of the issues with, with that is um, as all the cables were crushed uh, within the back of the entertainment system, the, a lot of these seemed to fail. So there was a replacement over to, uh, to the polymer fibre. Um, so that's that's something that's probably worth I think bearing bearing in mind always, um, and certainly something when we've been working with companies is always to think about the fitters. I think that's where a lot of the technology um, comes from. Um, uh, th thinking about how things are they're installed and trying to ruggedize them from there on up. But um, yeah, as, as for numbers, I'm not I'm not too sure. I mean, I'm sure there'd be aerospace um, specific, uh, sorry, aircraft specific. Um, but I mean, I'm not, I'm not um, sort of engaged with the fitting. Um, I think I got that statistic from listening to a talk from somebody from Airbus. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not too sure the, the fractions which, uh, which are used. Okay, so um, I'm going to read through the questions at the moment in the order which they came. Um, you can probably see them yourself, Chris. Uh, in the early 2000s, we were looking at fibre optic cable being impregnated with triboluminescence quartz buried in carbon fiber structure to identify damage or shift in carbon fiber structure. Does anything come from these trials? Have you used triboluminescence for identifying damage? And uh, no, I have not um, looked at triboluminescence um, before, but that, that'll be work I'll, uh, I'll look up for sure. Um, there has been a huge amount of, as I mentioned, work um, on carbon fiber in the past. 
Um, and traditionally, it's not been my um, my area of, of expertise. Um, only just just come in with this uh, with this solution that was sort of outlined. Uh, but no, that's that's one to one to look at look into. Obviously, you know, not heard of anything being commercialised at the moment. Uh, but it'd be interesting to see where that research went. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question from Ian Elder. What is the ultimate sensitivity of a fiber brag sensor? Yes, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so I guess it depends on, on what you're wanting it to sense. Um, but for example, if you look at strain, um, you can get the, the, the rule of thumb for, again, it depends on what type of optical fiber you're, you're looking at, but you can get about one nanometer of spectral shift um per thousands micro strains um so so the the ultimate resolution of a good quality brag grating um you're looking at you can look at picometers you can, you can probably pull out sub picometers some certainly some of the work that we've been doing we've been getting uh, resolutions of 0.3 um picometers um so yeah, so you're looking at a, a, a sub micro strain resolution for the through thickness uh, strain sensor in particular. You're probably looking at much. It's less sensitive in the through thick. The error bars are larger on the, in the through thickness dimension, um, but you're looking at um, micro strain level resolution in that dimension, which is better than nothing, you know. Um, and the um, uh, yeah, and, and the in plane strain is, is slightly better than that. But that's that's what you're looking for, and obviously it depends, as I say, the um, the type of optical fiber that you're looking at. So um, I mentioned about the polymer optical fibers, which are used um, in 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 car, in, and in the head-up displays in aircraft. Um, so polymers' response sense the sensitivity. If you, you can put brag racings within polymer optical fibers. If you strain them, so if you if you strain a silica optical fiber, it redshifts. Um, but if you strain a polymer optical fiber, it blue shifts. Um, and that's if, the, the reason for that is basically uh, down to the equation, the Sprague equation I shared um, earlier on. There's, a, there's an element to do with the refractive index and there's an element to do with the, the period change. There's a, almost a battle between those two because well, in silica, one goes one way, one goes the other. Um, but, in, um, but in polymer, the, the refractive index change dominates. Um, and it's actually an order of magnitude, or it can be an order depend on the polymer, um, or an order of magnitude um, greater in sensitivity. Um, but in the same light, the Bragg gratings in polymer optical fiber uh, can be worse. So it's, it can be difficult, uh, more difficult to get uh, you know, uh, the same amount of spectral resolution. So even though you've got that order of magnitude shift, um, it's not always, always better. Um, but well, there is a downside to polymer fiber in terms of the environments it can be used in. So silica is a lot more resilient in, um, in higher temperatures, so certainly a couple of hundred degrees C plus uh, for a lot of polymer. It can get a lot of polymer fibers. Um, and also things like water ingress and things like that, you need to worry about for polymer optical fibers. So, and obviously that could, that could lead to drift if you're after overall sensitivity. And so that was for strain. I think you know, it depends on what you're looking at exactly. Um, uh, if it was temperature, the, um, I think the temperature is about 10 picometers per degree Celsius. Um, so 10 picometers is spectral shift per degree C. And as I said, about 0.3 picometer resolution uh, that you can get um, from these brag races, uh, from interpreting these brag racings. Okay, thank you. A um, question from Mike Underhill. How do you... How do you tell when you are reaching the safe limit of weight saving in a composite material? And is there a known fatigue limit when used in an aircraft? And how much weight saving can be, can be predicted in the future for aircraft use? Well, this is an excellent question. And this is one I really want to find, get to the bottom of. Um, so, I mean, I get the, the big issue is, you know, for, Formula One, things like Formula One cars, uh, you know, they operate on, like, really on the edge. And you can see that, you know, some, sometimes everything goes goes wrong. And thank goodness, the, um, like certainly these days, the um, the drivers are, are safe and uninjured. But, um, you know, on an aircraft, there's no hard shoulder. There's no 
you know, that there's nothing that, you know, if, you, if it fails, it fails. So there always has to be that, that level of very good certainty. And certainly what I'm trying to do now, so this is, you know, early development of these sensors and we've shown this capability is to, um, my expertise is, is, is optics, it's optical fabrication. Is, um, well, what, what I want to do is put in a, um, an, a large episode grant linking over to with the, uh, the Bristol Composite Institute, um, who have expertise in composite materials, um, and also um, colleagues I've got in the Alan Turing Institute to pull in AI. So I think this is a combined interdisciplinary um, um, uh, answer to this in terms of certainly for the sensing how how certain and it all depends on how certain we can be so for an aircraft as i said there's it's elements of certainty um and i think for now we just we just don't know um in terms of how of what that reduction can be um but every kilo that that, that saves um you know the more fuel efficient um that you know more fuel fuel efficient that creates the entire aircraft um so it feels like not an answer but something that's um that, that certainly in my mind and obviously this all you know I, I, what will eventually be implemented is is backed up against um you know the, the policy makers as well you know the the um, um aviation authority will you know have these limitations in place it's a very cons the aviation sector is hugely conservative and and rightly it is you know it makes uh, huge it makes changes it's at its peril really um, so it's very conservative. I think the the change will be will be slow, or um, hopefully hopefully not too slow, and hopefully we uh, we get the changes that are that are needed, um, but we'll still stay safe. Um, so sorry, I don't really feel like I've answered your question, other than it's something that's on my mind, and we're going to be certainly the, um, my group are, are working towards answering that question. Okay, thank you. Um, question from Richard Edney. Uh, you have focused on strain sensors. Would you like to comment on the broad range of other properties that can be sensed optically? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I can say, I mean, obviously, it's huge. <laughs> um, I can say maybe some other things that our group has been uh, looking into. So one of the things uh, of interest. Another way you can lightweight an aircraft is through looking at the fuel. So the fuel of an aircraft or, or fuel is very um, hygroscopic. It loves water and certainly some of these more sustainable um, uh, fuels, biofuels that are, that are coming onto the market even more so. And effectively what you get is you know, huge amounts of, of water being, um, it, it being absorbed within the fuel tanks and you know routinely routine maintenance there's a draining of that water um, and the issue is you don't really nobody really knows what level of water it is and in, even even indeed in what state it's in um, so some of the work that we've been doing is um, looking to see whether the water can be monitored whether you can figure out how much water is in there to drain it. Um, and also, I mean, there are even questions with, the, with these new types of, um, of, of uh, aircraft fuels. Um, the, the, uh, the capacitance-based probes um, are, 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 are completely confused um, by the dielectric properties um, of these fuels. So, you know, is there an optical alternative that will answer some of these questions? Um, so, so fuel um, certainly is one, and if you re, you know if you can get rid of a large amount of unnecessary parasitic water that's being carried around um, on each in, in, in each um, continental flight, for example, you know you, it, there's huge implications for for um, for CO two um, reduction reduction there. Um, but yeah, but also um, temperature is a big one. Um, so temperature is a huge influence on um, on, on sensor um, or what you observe on a sensor. So is it is it strain or um, is it a temperature change? Um, indeed, in a fuel 
you know, can you decouple the, um, so a lot of the work we've done on fuels has been looking, just probing the refractive index or scattering properties of fuel. And to what, what degree that is, um, that is down to a temperature change. Um, so normally what we try to do, certainly on the chips that I mentioned, is to put a few different types of uh, sensors and definitely a, a thermal reference is something that we place on the, so we normally place a thermal reference sensor right next to uh, the, the sensor that we're looking at, you know, millimeters apart. Um, so we can decouple that. Um, but yeah, there's a whole, whole range of, uh, of other applications. I mean, biological applications where you can, um, you can probe, you, you can functionalize uh, the surface of a sensor. You can, um, uh, you can have that sensitive to particular uh, chemicals or, um, or viruses, etc. cetera. Um, and you, you, you can probe, I mean, with these Bragg gratings, you can, so you can certainly um, probe changes um, on, on surfaces um, with a sensor that's exposed. Uh, but I mean, yeah, there's a, there's a huge, huge amount um, out there in the literature that, that, that can be done. That's a sort of a flavor of, I guess, some of the things that we've been looking at. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Simeon Earl. What issues can you foresee with the use of optical fiber within flight critical systems? Uh, so I guess a lot of flight critical systems, you know, they, they are uh, critical, have a huge amount of redundancy. Um, so normally tertiary redundancy, so three sensors for one thing. Um, So, but I guess with any new technology, there's always, there's always, um, there's always going to be risks. Um, there's nothing that I, I can particularly see uh, at, at the moment that wouldn't be ironed out, I guess, within, within testing, um, unless the person asking the question has something a specific in, in, in mind um, when, when asking that. Um, I do see it as a, you know, Photonics is a, um, it has some very good advantages in terms of its sensitivity, resilience in harsh environments, um, the, the cabling issue, which I mentioned. I think the biggest barrier, why it's, you know, so you ask, well, why has it not been done before? Why is it not already out there? Um, it's probably been the interrogation and the cost of the interrogation. Um, so, you know, whilst optical fiber itself is pence per meter, uh, you know, certainly 10 years ago, optical interrogators, you're looking at 20,000 pounds to, you know, interrogate. And, you know, maybe we, we could look at, I don't know, eight or 16 um, different Bragg ratings. So it was quite expensive, but thank goodness the, the number of um, Bragg ratings you can interrogate has gone up and the, the cost has come down. It's still quite expensive. Um, but I mean, a, a trend that I've observed, certainly with the partners that we work in, work with is that, uh, um, they, they have uh, more air certified interrogators they, they can put in the avionics bay um, and they are they are going down the lines of, um, of, of testing them to the to, to the full um, so yeah I think I think there's been that barrier um, but I don't see any specific um, risks as for example you know as we've mentioned spark risks for maybe an electronic sensor in a fuel tank uh, would have because of the advantages so I sort of outlined before. I think it, I think it's just traditionally had a a barrier to entry, um, a cost barrier to entry um, issue. There's a there's a comment coming back from Richard Edney saying many military flight critical are already on fiber. You're a fighter typhoon, for example. Yeah, for, for, for comms, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it, it emerges um, in the military sector first. Mm. Okay, next question from Ian Sudlow. Have you tested maximum temperature or pressure tolerance of cure cycle for embedded sensors in carbon panels? Is there a limitation? Yes, uh, the, the cure temperature uh, we've been using, again, this is not my field's optics. Um, you know, it's not the, the optics that you, you tend to worry about. Um, so the, from recollection, we've been, these things are about 180 degrees C 
um, in an autoclave. So there's been about seven or eight bar um, pressure on, on these panels. Um, we've we, we've not taken them to the temperatures um, higher than higher than that. Again, this is, this is not my, my area of expertise. I can comment on the, on the properties of um, on the carbon fiber. Other than that, it was a standard aerospace grade um, carbon fiber, unidirectional carbon fiber that we used from uh, GKN. That they provided us. Um, that we just followed the recipe. Uh, we have been having issues, or we had issues at the start. So we were trying to glue or epoxy um, optical fiber um, to these planar sensors. Um, and we were, we were observing even with very high temperature glues, there was, um, there was issues because of the, the, the size of the, um, the blob of epoxy, if you like, um, and causing failure at that point. So that's why we moved to this new solution where we fuse and splice. So I showed in one of the slides, um, the flat fiber fuse and splice to, to regular fiber. Um, and that's done at, at very high um, sort of glass transition temperatures. Um, and the two glasses are, are effectively pushed together and they become sort of monolithic, they, they become sort of mixed together. So they're, they're good up to certainly well past the, um, the temperature of um, which, um, which make the carbon fiber panel. Um, and there's, there's, yeah, there's, there's, no, there's no epoxy or anything, so it's very sort of slim and streamlined, streamlined once it's, um, once, once that fusion splicing is, is done. A question from Saba Milvaganam. This is a very interesting and exciting work with many potential applications. Bragg cell based sensing of pressure was in use in the offshore industry with fibers included in the drill string, first launched by Weathersheds, I think. These sensors were designed to withstand high temperatures and pressures. Any comment, comments on the usage of this sensor? In high temperature and pressure environments. Yeah, so I think I'm aware of um, some of the work that's been done on these, uh, these deep sea deep sea sort of drilling um, applications. I think largely, you know, I think they I can't remember their exact lifetime, but they weren't they weren't great. Um, so I don't the temperature and pressure. Yeah, is one thing, and I think it was largely the the water ingress because of those those high temperatures and pressures that ultimately um, killed a lot of those sensors. Um, so I think it's, yeah, it's submersion of glass really within high temperature and pressure, salty water environments, um, um, that's an issue. Um, so I think that's what, um, yeah, that, that, that refers to, I'm not, maybe the, um, yeah, I think it was maybe a week or a few days, um, these things survived, uh, but as I say, it was down, well, it's put largely down to the, to the water uh, issue. One of the things with glass as well, you get devitrification. Um, so if you go above 800 degrees C, um, for, for silica fiber, you wouldn't really want to go much higher than that. As I say, there's other types of fibers. So there's um, sapphire based fibers, for example, that can go uh, significantly higher. Okay, um, I have a question from someone who's anonymous, but despite that, we'll let him ask a question or her ask a question. Would embedded optical switches have any thermal loss with respect to energy and electronic monitoring? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, this is a this is a good point. So the switch that we showed um, was thermo optically um, tuned. Um, so obviously there will be thermal thermal loss. Um, and ideally, it was kind of used as a demonstrator and the, the ultimate application I'd see. Um, so you want to manipulate the signal of light. And this, I think, in a concert will be done at sort of, uh, you know, hertz or, um, hertz or sort of lower frequency. Um, it, I don't think you would do it thermally. Ultimately, you'd probably want to switch it optically. Um, so you may have something else that's on there in this it could be a max ender structure or, or or something else that would that would do that switching so i think there is a there's an ultimate limitation i think taking the technology forward um it would not be done um thermally just because of the sort of thermal management um 
um, issues and concerns there. But I think for a sort of a demonstrator that this is kind of interesting and um, we have the potential, I think, to go forward and think about how we restructure the architecture and composite materials um, for optical fibers, which is something that's been around for you know, 30, 30 plus years before optical fibers and, and composites. I think it's really, you know, really interesting. There can be a lot done there. But yes, yeah, certainly, you know, moving away from thermal actuation would be my desire. Great, thank you. Um, one more question from Kevin. You mentioned harsh environments. How about, how about vibration survivability, especially in the helicopter? Hmm. Yeah, so um, that's exactly one thing we're, we're looking into at the moment, uh, which is looking into vibration monitoring um, in helicopters. Um, and in there, we're, we're integrating the, looking to integrate the optical fiber um, within within the sort of uh, the housings and structural components. Um, so it would sort of seamlessly fit and, and be part, you know, part, part of the components. Um, so there is, there is issues uh, with, you know, vibration. So for example, with those micromechanical systems um, subject to vibration, um, you could have a few issues. Um, certainly for the membranes, um, you know, if you hit the resonant frequency of those membranes, you know, you, you could cause them to, to pop. So that was one of the things that we, you know, we were exploring um, when we were making the, um, the, the packaging and the membranes themselves, you know, trying to avoid the sorts of frequencies that you get, you know, kilohertz frequencies that you get um, on aircraft and, you know, making sure that there's nothing resonating on those chips. Um, but certainly, yeah, for, for optical fibers, um, yeah, we 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 go about making the sensors in a particular way to make them very sensitive to vibration. They're not actually inherently. If you have a brag grating, that's you know, if it's not you know, unless it's a sort of huge, this is probably going to destroy you know destroy the um, the the components sort of vibration. You don't normally. They're not normally um, that responsive, as I say, unless they're on a mechanical um, structure. They're not actually that, that responsive to, uh, to vibration, that's something we found. So we've have to, we've come about a way to, um, to leverage and amplify the, the response of the brag grating, um, but still integrate it into a, into a structure. Um, but yeah, but so answer um, uh, minimal. Um, you do get things like, like um, and bend loss and things like that. You know, it vibrates if it, it fibers are sort of flapping around. And um, certainly for these you know, micro mechanical structures, you, you would worry about um, natural frequency. So you'd have to design the the structure um, to, to to sort of overcome any such features. Okay. Well, um, on behalf of the audience. Well, unfortunately, at this stage in virtual environments, cannot give a round of applause. Uh, and the IET uh, Sussex branch, I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I found it very interesting. I've learned a lot. Um, and um, thank you very much and uh, have a good evening, everybody. Thanks very much for the invite, uh, Dave. And uh, if anybody wants to get in touch, uh, please do so, as I mentioned. Um, other questions, we're happy to have a chat. Um, take care and good evening.